This is Religion and Theology, a podcast from the Center for Theology and Religious Studies. During a brief European tour, Professor Karl Raschke came to CTR and held a seminar on his new book, Neoliberalism and Political Theology, From Kant to Identity Politics. Raschke is professor of religious studies at the University of Denver, and in this seminar, he will himself give an excellent summary and explanation to the ways in which the themes already mentioned in the title of the book unfolds and are discussed. is available, I think, in the United Kingdom where it's being published, but it hasn't been available in America. I don't even have any copies yet, but it is, its date of publication is this month, so it should be out any any time right now. So, so what I'm going to do today is uh, perhaps just kind of outline what the, what the book is about to talk a little about the project. Um, the book was a follow-up to the book one I published in 2015 with Columbia University Press, uh, which is called Force of God and the Crisis of Liberal Democracy. And um, I sort of got the inspiration for this book for two reasons. Um, In 2016, um, I was asked to give some lectures at the the University of Vienna. or I'm, I'm sort of a permanent visiting scholar there, on uh, my book, Force of God, but that was also when the 2016 presidential election was taking place, and of course we all know what happened that year. That was also the summer of Brexit, and so we knew there was a kind of political change happening. Myself, like everybody else in America, we didn't expect Donald Trump to win the presidential election, uh, and so it was a surprise and a shock. Uh, I think for many of my colleagues, it was a trauma. I was not surprised because a lot of the uh, political tensions uh, that I was seeing, uh, I, at the time, I was serving as uh, one of the editors for a online publication called Political Theology Today, which... Uh, is now the Political Theology Network, which is tied into the journal that is uh, uh, published by Rutledge called Political Theology. And I had been writing some articles kind of warning that this election was not going to have the results that everybody expected. Um, Probably one of the reasons that is that I've, unlike 99% of academics, I maintain Uh, my ears to the ground and a close relationship to people in the working class. Um, We, um, my family has uh, property, it's a kind of a retreat center in one of the most rural and, as we say, redneck parts of the country, uh, southern Oklahoma, and I spend my summers there and I've gotten to know the people there, so you're kind of listening these are the kind of people that very few academics even pay attention to, let alone take seriously. So I saw that, so I began to see that there was a uh, there was a real divide, a class divide, uh, taking place. But it wasn't so much about economic class; it was about education. So that got me thinking uh, about perhaps writing a new book. Uh, and so I shaped the lectures I gave at the University of Vienna around the question of the meaning of class today. Uh, um, I had actually published earlier in the 2000s uh, a book um, that was on the digital revolution and the way it was going to affect higher education. Um, it's called postmodernism. It's called uh, postmodernism and the coming of the excuse me, um, the digital revolution and the coming of the postmodern university, which came out right, um, right in 2000. And 
was very much influenced in that book by the work of Peter Drucker, who was talking about the transformation that was going in the global economy. It wasn't so much capitalism, but it was a new kind of capitalism, a capitalism based on information or uh, based on uh, capital that was essentially virtual, uh, not not factories and um, you know machinery, uh, but um, um, but chips uh, and software and uh, networks, uh, and of course the the melt the financial meltdown of 2018, um, excuse me, 2008, was because of the fact that capitalism had become etherealized. It had become virtualized. Uh, the uh, so-called uh, um, um, SIVs, uh, special investment vehicles. Uh, uh, a number of scholars uh, have written about this. Philip Goodchild, who's a good friend of mine at the University of Nottingham, talks about this in his book, Theology of Money. Uh, in, in the way in, in which, in sense, what has value now is simply what we would call semiotic differentials, uh, the, you know, the D sign and this kind of thing. And one of the in interesting um, episodes uh, that I experienced about that time was I was at a um, church gathering uh, in Texas, maybe 2003. 2006, and one of the members of the particular church that was hosting the gathering was a former FBI agent uh, who had investigated the Enron scandal, uh, which had caused a big financial panic in 2001-2002. He was telling me what was most significant about this scandal was that no, that the the people that had managed it didn't understand what these this, these forms of money they had invented were going to do. They, they hired these mathematical geniuses out of MIT who came up with these algorithms to make them rich, and they got very rich, and they bought up companies and so forth. But he said none of the management of Enron, in, including the mathematical whiz kids who had come up with the algorithms, knew you know what they meant. They didn't understand them. So in some ways, the 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 computerization of finance was changing the very nature of you know of the whole economic system uh, of the world. And of course, with the meltdown in two thousand and eight, um, that you know kind of solidified things for us. So I began to uh, connect these trends and phenomena and also my experience of the kind of class anger that I was seeing around uh, people who didn't have uh, much education. And uh, I went back actually to my Karl Marx and said, well, what, what would Marx do? What would Marx say about the current situation? Um, so out of this came you might say the background uh, research and the original thought bites uh, for the book. But let me get into the book itself. So in recent years, there's been a, a slowly rising tide of academic works on the topic of what we call neoliberalism. In the previous day, much uh, in this last decade, much of the discussion has centered on the fundamentally economic question of the new, the new global capitalism and the changes uh, that have been wrought uh, following the demise of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. Now, the term neoliberalism was, was first applied as far back as the late 1930s uh, as a term of leverage that was invented by a, a group of economists and political thinkers who were known as the Mount Pelerin Society. And they wanted to argue against fascist and other as, uh, kinds of totalitarian systems. Um, and so the term neoliberalism became a kind of master signifier for this new con concern uh, for free markets and free markets as a prop uh, to maintain democracy against the 
threats of totalitarian forms of communism and, uh, and fascism. Uh, the leading lights of the so-called um, neoliberal movement uh, were uh, primarily economists such as uh, Milton Friedman of the Chicago School, um, but there were also other intellectual luminaries such as Gary Becker, uh, Ronald Coase, uh, Richard Posner, Lars Peter Hansen, and Eugene Fama. Now, these came to be called or lumped under the general rubric of the Chicago School. Many of them were at Chicago, but not all of them were. Um, and they were the, media, the immediate heirs of the Mount Pelerin Society. And they gave original currency to the term neoliberal. That was their term. Now, this kind of thinking found for the first time a powerful ear in the presidency of Ronald Reagan uh, in 1980. And that in itself was a consequence of the social dislocations and the sort of economic trauma that was experienced in the 1970s, uh, what was known as the Great Inflation, um, uh, or phenomena that was not predicted by Keynesian economics at all, so-called stagflation, where you can have, you know, essentially rising unemployment, but also rising prices at the same time. And these trends uh, seem to defy, uh, you know, everything that, you know, conventional economic theory um, had predicted. Um, the, the head of the uh, Federal Reserve in America, Robert Volcker, um, basically increased interest rates to levels that had never been seen in the Western world, sometimes by the, I think, the early 1980s, as high as uh, 13, 14, even 20 percent. And this, of course, caused a massive recession in the in early 1980s. Uh, the standard economic analysis of the time maintained that the reason you had stagflation was because you had a lack of productivity that was coming about because of too much power uh, on the part of labor unions, um, but, but also the uh, social welfare state. And I would say it wasn't just in America that these uh, economic uh, uh, problems were happening. They were happening, you know, all over the Western world. They were, in a sense, a kind of disease that had set in for the post-war social democratic economies uh, in in both hemispheres. Um, I don't want to get into economic uh, theory right now. It's not only because it's not all that interesting, but it's also not that relevant. Um, so. Um, Reagan and his partner in uh, the UK, uh, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, decided that they would uh, apply the kind of drastic remedy that had been recommended by the Chicago School. Uh, that is, uh, you know, have have a loosening, a, a radical loosening of economic controls of the social system. Uh, and uh, also diminishing the power of labor unions, and in a sense turning uh, turning Americans, you know, economic production over to what might be called immaterial labor. This was the beginnings of what came to be known as the service economy. Um, so. Uh, Reagan was a very popular president. Uh, so was Margaret Thatcher. Um, they, this, of course, was appalling to, to traditional liberals. Um, the term neoliberal was not used then, uh, but when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, the term began to be applied to the new kind of spirit of capitalism. And the, the underlying premise of this new kind of way of thinking, uh, which was reflected in the so-called third way uh, politics of America, it, most uh, prominent representative was Bill Clinton, was that uh, essentially you could have democracy if you uh, deregulated uh, uh, industry. Uh, you, I think a better term might be desocialize de it. Now we're talking about the need for new democratic socialism and the uh, re 
uh, appropriation of the reins of industry by the government and so forth. But in this process, not, not only, you might say, the governing political ideology changed drastically, uh, but also the economy itself. Um, Robert Reich uh, wrote a, who became Bill Clinton's um, um, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, wrote a scathing article in the late 1980s about uh, what was going on on Wall Street um, with, you know, t talking about how it was, it was all about money and, you know, there were no real goods being produced. So in other words, we were increasingly producing unreal things and we were consuming unreal things like books, uh, entertainment, education, uh, and so forth. And you know how this was causing distortions within not, not only the traditional capitalist economy that had been maintained by Keynesian theory since the 1930s, but you know at the same time uh, was uh, undermining the ability of ordinary people to make a living. And he was right about that because we've now seen the statistics. Uh, uh, neoliberalism was not really a policy so much that was put into effect as it was a kind of attitude which shaped how we viewed government. And the, and the term uh, that was fashionable during this period was uh, democratic capitalism, uh, particularly with the collapse of Soviet totalitarianism, uh, the idea uh, came to the fore that if you would let capital be free, and if you would let, you know, free speech, uh, the, the free flow of information, um, in a sense, you broke down national bound, boundaries, uh, a trend which had been, um, you know, already promoted uh, on the European continent by the common market, the forerunner of the EU, that this would, uh, in essentially, bring about not only uh, increased productivity, uh, but all, also uh, would spread the wealth uh, and simultaneously uh, would uh, sustain um, um, participatory democracy. Well, of course, we know that that really didn't, wasn't the case, um, but it seemed to be the case. And of course, the profit of this new mood was uh, a former State Department employee uh, who uh, wrote an article in the prestigious journal Foreign Affairs in 1990 uh, called uh, The um, End of um, uh, um, the End of History and the Last Man. His name was Francis Fukuyama. And this became, you know, kind of the manifesto for neoliberalism. Interestingly, uh, Fukuyama just published a book about two years ago uh, denying, you know, everything he wrote in 1990. But he always seems to be on top of trends because he, he was able to diagnose in many respects um, what is wrong with neoliberalism. And in some ways, his analysis parallels mine in, in many particular ways. Um, so... So both criticism and caution regarding the heady triumphalism uh, of this particular period, uh, you know, began to percolate. Um, now, by the late 1990s, there was a certain skepticism about whether, in fact, uh, the the spread of global capitalism and the emergence of a form of governance known as neoliberalism really was uh, bringing peace and happiness to the world. Um, and it, it, we had a, a kind of mini recession in 2000, 2001, uh, right before uh, September 11th. Um, and a lot of that was attributed to what the uh, Alan Greenspan, the uh, former head of the um, Federal Reserve, had called uh, rational, uh, you know, irrational exuberance, the so-called dot-com bubble, uh, and the dot-com bubble was, you know, essentially a speculative bubble that was fomented by the new. Uh, digital um, entrepreneurship that was taking place and that was growing up in 
Silicon Valley, um, companies that had basically no uh, revenues to speak, you know, but, you know, it was all about the promise of the future that the digital revolution was going to bring about. And, of course, their uh, stock valuation soared through the roof, and then right around uh, 1999 or 2000, the whole the whole house of cards began to come tumbling down. So this was the occasion for the first kind of serious critique of neoliberalism and the idea that uh, that what was essentially a, a, mo a money economy uh, or what Robert Reich had called a symbolic economy, you know, wasn't really uh, the wave of future prosperity that, that so many people had uh, predicted. But the landmark book that that exposed the need for a deeper critique of the neoliberal paradigm uh, came about a decade later um, in a, with a book by Wendy Brown, who is a political uh, philosopher, political theorist at the University of California, Berkeley. It was called Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism, Stealth Revolution. And anyone who kind of follows the uh, literature on neoliberalism has, is certainly aware of this book because it's... Uh, it, it, it was a kind of um, groundbreaker. Uh, Brown both mined and expanded on what had been uh, the alternative socio-political uh, in contrast with the economic account of neoliberalism that had been sketched out by uh, my, uh, Michel Foucault uh, in the 1970s. He was the first, of course, to talk about neoliberalism as a, a form of uh, politi political um, political control, or what he called governance, or governmentality. Um, and she built heavily on Foucault, as I do myself, uh, in, in my own book. Um, but um, Brown, at the same time, had given short shrift uh, to, you know, many of Foucault's insights. Uh, Brown's argument, which was both penetrating uh, and passionate in its polemics, uh, brought to the fore a fundamental claim that neoliberal constitutes, using Foucault's uh, own language, the dominant episteme, or the dominant form of knowledge of the 20th, 21st century, one that in fact embraces not just economics and politics, but the whole of culture itself. And so then came the summer of 19... Uh, or, excuse me, of 2016, which brought with it, like a, a violent Midwest Western storm cell, a sudden global groundswell of seemingly angry populist and nationalist uprisings of the ballot box. The weather line was not confined to the presidential election that year, um, as was signaled by the def unexpected defeat of Hillary Clinton um, by Donald Trump. It also spread across Europe and certain regions of the developing world. Um, the press and the Western intelligentsia were aghast and sought to explain this tide as some kind of atavistic upsurge of darker political proclivities and anxieties, uh, routinely comparing trends in the 1930s and at times uh, mimicking the Frankfurt School's favorite distinction between myth and enlightenment. Uh, but the comparison was more superficial than genuine. Um, it was not fascism. It was a coming apart of the whole kind of neoliberal order that uh, was cracking at the seams politically because it had already, uh, you know, fractured at the economic level. Uh, the Great Recession from 2008, of course, nobody knows exactly when to end it. We might say just arbitrarily 2012 um, was really the... Um, you know, the rallying point for those who became disaffected with neoliberalism, and, and I would say both on the right and on the left. Um, but th this attempt to try to, you know, look back to the 1930s and, you know, and saying that history was re re repeating itself, um, th there, was, there was something that was not totally genuine about that. Uh, the comparison was more superficial than many people realize. Something else was afoot. And certain other political theorists, such as New School political um, 
philosopher Nancy Fraser, who had already established herself as a leading exponent of gender theory and identity politics, immediately saw hidden causal connections between the regime of neoliberalism and the, and the antagonism felt toward it on the part of the new populace, um, uh, and, and, and saw that some kind of new trend, which even um, Wendy Brown, who she criticized, had missed. Uh, in a sequence of articles in prominent publications starting as early as the fall of 2016, uh, Fraser coined the seemingly oxymoronic expression progressive neoliberalism to set in relief the planetary hobgoblin which populist politics seemed to be reacting. Um, progressivism is always viewed as a kind of antithesis of populism and, you know, if you read so much of the literature and the rhetoric we hear today, you know, we talk about populism and it gets overtones of fascism and so forth. Um, uh, Fraser took a different view, interestingly, um, and being a feminist, one would not expect that. But she really had some kind of trenchant insights into what was going on. And there is a new book uh, that just came out about a year and a half ago, which supports a lot of her arguments. Uh, in fact, I've been reading it lately. It's uh, by two authors uh, naming, named Eatwell and Goodwin, and it's called National Populism. Uh, and it, it, it builds on um, academic theories of populism, particularly uh, the Marxist variant by Ernesto Laclau, the well-known um, uh, Argentinian uh, political thinker, uh, to show that, in a sense, populism is neither right nor left, but, but populism is a signifier of what might be see, seen as a kind of, you know, empty anxiety about the failure of the promise of neoliberalism. Um, so the thesis of, of this book, um, and I'm following along here with Foucault and Brown and other prominent international figures such as uh, Bernard Stiegler, Axel Honeth, who uh, Fraser has uh, collaborated with, and a German sociologist named Wolfgang Streich, uh, who are not so well known in um, Anglophone uh, academic circles, but, you know, are very important thinkers. It's, it's interesting that um, America, which invented neoliberalism, that it's uh, academic... Uh, um, Seers don't have seemed to be, you know, kind of blinded uh, by this, you know, and perhaps the polarizing rhetoric of figures like Trump has had a lot to do with it. But uh, what's going on in Europe isn't really that much different from what's going on in America. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, if you look at, say, uh, the uh, developments that are taking place in countries like India, which we don't pay a lot of attention to politically, particularly uh, the uh, policies and the means of government and figures like Modi, uh, and we're also beginning to see it in even countries like Indonesia, even in Islamic countries. We can see that populism is definitely on the rise. Sometimes the word is ethno-nationalism, and the implication is, well, all these populist reactions are racist in some way. But of course, racism itself is a fraught term, and it has a different meaning, say, in an American context vis-a-vis -vis Latino immigrants or in relationship to um, African-American, you know, um, descendants of slaves and than it does to the Dalit classes in India uh, and their positioning in social society uh, and also say what is going on in Eastern Europe such as in the Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, we have to look at populism and ethno-nationalism in these various terms as part of a complex sea change that is um, in, in, in many ways pulling the ground under out from under the neoliberal regime that has been ascendant for the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, but um, even these writers who I've just mentioned, they tend to skip over the genealogical question, how neoliberalism came to be the hegemonic thought template that is increasingly grinding with seismic re repercussions against the material interests uh, of those of the new populace. Um, 
it's it's my position that these conflicts were ultimately the output of deeper moral and religious forces that are dividing both the West and the westernized rest of the world uh, that have been, um, in many respects, bewitched by neoliberalism. So what we do need to do at first is hypothesize that neoliberalism is not so much an economic or a political formation as it is a value configuration against which much of the world is now in open revolt. A genealogy of, ne of neoliberal morals or moral valuation therefore demands a kind of Nietzschean intervention that grapples with and unmasks the pretenses under which it is so effectively perpetuated. And I, there's another figure who I didn't mention before, but who becomes important. He's a uh, Italian, uh, French um, social theorist uh, um, by the name of Maurizio Lazzarato. That's L-A-Z-Z-A-R-T-O. And he's uh, um, written a very influential book called The uh, Making of Indebted Man. Uh, he talks about neoliberalism as essentially in a form of indebtedness. And he relies heavily uh, as does Foucault upon Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure to uh, what degree many of you are familiar with that book and Nietzsche's analysis, but it's, be, it's become a very in, important kind of theoretical strand in uh, the um, literature uh, on neo, uh, the, the literature that critiques neoliberalism. The pre pretense has been one of democratic capitalism in, in tandem with the social ethics of cosmopolitan humanitarianism that conceals its underlying agenda of economic exploitation and, and predation. It, what I say is neoliberalism as a, you know, as a kind of moral outlook is the most recent version of Europe's civilizing mission, as it was called in the age of colonialism. Uh, a civilizing mission to the so-called backward nations of the world. Um, and uh, so it's not simply a new colonialism in the strict economic sense, though it is. It turns about to be what Foucault called uh, an apparel, or um, which is often translated as apparatus, but perhaps is better rendered, rendered as a operation of power relations. And it, it employs as a full ensemble various strategies of discourse, valuations, social pressure, economic mechanisms, and political instrumentalities, both to colonize effectively those outside its realm and to maintain control over those whom it has already subjugated. It's hence a scarcely perceptible mega apparatus that lurks in the background that to uh, use the title of a song uh, from the um, 1970s is killing us softly. We're not even aware of its toxicity. By the way, I wanted to use uh, killing us softly as the title of the book, but uh, in Edinburgh University Press says, you know, we don't, we don't do metaphors with our titles. There's this, there's this new kind of um, attitude among marketers and university presses that if a catalog librarian can't understand what it means, then we, we can't use the word. So, um, you know, so I, that's what I wanted to call the book. But anyway, so um, let me talk about what, uh, what I do. So what time did we start here? I just want to make sure. I've uh, 35 minutes ago. OK, uh, so we got about 10 more minutes. Yeah. OK. Um, um, so basically, I'm saying is neoliberalism has to be diagnosed and analyzed as a kind of political theology. Uh, it's a form of normative political thought that is grounded in a certain set of transcendental systems of convictions that are ultimately theological in origin. And this is how I think you know, my book distinguishes itself from other writers or uh, you know, those who have uh, sought to diagnose what neoliberalism is. Um, hence, we find Schmidt's phrase political theology to be a highly useful 
uh, signifier of these kinds of convictions, one that could be introduced as a vital apparatus in its own right for comprehending the meaning of, of the expression neoliberalism. Um, so my own genealogical project, therefore, you know, undertakes a venture of mapping the deep political theology of neoliberalism. Now, the, ch the first chapter that you've read, if you've read it, um, Toward a ge Genealogy of Neoliberalism, roughs out a more capacious project of decoding neoliberalism as a system of signifiers in the fashion that Foucault himself undertook uh, in his greater work, not merely in his lectures from the 70s and 80s, but uh, um, subsequently in those who've interpreted him, laying the foundation of what we now call cultural studies uh, along with critical theory. In some ways, I think you could consider this book uh, to be uh, a contribution to the literature of critical theory. Um, uh, the first chapter frames the question of neoliberalism as a wider cultural and political one. What Foucault hinted was the source of our new world, world disorder, what he called a crisis of representation, which is uh, a um, concept uh, that I use extensively in my book, uh, Force of God. Uh, I, I launch into a lengthy anatomy of this covert leviathan um, in using in the, in the Hobbesian sense there, uh, sketching the multidimensional makeup of neoliberalism, relying on the work of Lazzarato himself. Lazzarato has, has pinpointed the crucial interplay of, of these signifying processes within the, within the larger, larger operating system of neoliberalism that keeps it going. In other words, the reinforcing mechanisms of financial debt, which are... Um, in, in many ways uh, uh, tied in with a, a kind of psychological sense of debt, uh, moral obligation. And of course, um, this can be found in the, uh, the, double, the double meaning of the German word schuld, uh, which is both guilt uh, and debt. Uh, and perhaps in Swedish you have a similar word. I'm not, familiar with what your Swedish words are, but uh, the, the terms come from the Germanic languages. Uh, chapter two, which is on prog called Progressive Neoliberalism and its Discontents, characterizes the American presidential election of 2016 as a pivotal moment that threw into relief for the first time the contest between neoliberalism and the new global populism. It focused on the usage of the current uh, political term cosmopolitan and its origins in both ancient philosophy and 20th, and 20th century Mar Marxist rhetoric. And it, looks, and it looks at the relationship between this as a kind of moral value system uh, and also as a economic project, as being essentially what Antonio Gramsci termed the distinctive ideological hegemony of our day. More importantly, it links this sort of perspective with Nietzsche's own diagnosis in his unpublished works, uh, where he diagnosed what he called modern nihilism, whereby the highest values uh, devalue themselves. Chapters three, um, which I call the kingdom, the power, the glory, and the tawdry, uh, explores uh, a Gombin celebrated double paradigm of sovereignty. Uh, introducing the Christian idea of oikonomia, economy, as a foundational political concept in Western thinking. In this section, I argue that Agamben's far-ranging discussion improves our understanding of how Foucault's, Foucault's notion of bio, biopower actually develops historically from the matrix of early Christianity and how it becomes its own kind of political theology to undergird the contemporary uh, forms of neoliberalism. Uh, for example, Foucault talks about the pastorate, and I would say that the neoliberal apparel or apparatus uh, functions very much like the Foucaultian pastorate. Uh, it basically enforces a, va a value system, a, sen a, a scheme of transcendental obligations, which everybody, you know, feels, you know, obligated to and uh, feels debt from, not only economic debt, but moral debt. Uh, in chapter four, 
uh, which is entitled Killing Us Softly on Neoliberal Truth Pro Protocols, I returned to Foucault and uh, briefly concerning what he calls the problem of veridiction or truth-telling. I make the case that neoliberal truth claims uh, can be traced all the way back uh, to Descartes with his a uh, vision of a mathesis universalis, of a kind of universal way of mathematizing, or today we would say of digitizing knowledge, uh, making it binary and making it effective for the transformation of the human condition. And here I bank heavily on the insights of, of uh, Strake, uh, Wolfgang Strake, and the French social theorist Pierre Bourdieu to elaborate on what is entailed in what I call these neoliberal truth protocols. It's these kind of protocols, along with the politics inherent in that have kept capitalism alive all these centuries. That, that's Strake's argument. In addition, I explain through historical observations how so-called progressivist politics from its very beginnings in the 19th century have always earmarked neoliberal prototypes of governments and how such politics is inextricably bounded, bound up with such truth procedures. Uh, and finally, I take up the matter of what is called moral cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and its intimate relationship with colonialism and the market-driven expansion of the new forms of global capital. And here's interesting, this is kind of probably the most contentious move I make. I single out the, uh, the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant, on whom I did my dissertation many years ago, um, to be in regards to the authentic gray eminence of neoliberalism. Uh, in Chapter 5, which I call the epistemic crisis, I connect the trend toward what I, what I describe as the, media, the mediatization of the political in the sense that Agamemnon is talking about. It's a type of economic sovereignty um, that is tied in with what um, other thinkers have called the epistemic crisis of high modernism. Uh, high modernism is a term coined by political scientist and anthropologist James C. Scott, and I inquire into the relationship between the high modernist epistemology and what I call the new political theology lurking behind the innovations of Thomas Hobbes, Adam Smith, Kant, and the arch theorist himself of present-day neoliberalism, uh, Friedrich Hayek. Uh, in chapter six, which is entitled Globalism, Multiculturalism, and the Politics of Recognition, I come back to Fraser's idea of progressive neoliberalism and show how its signature theme, that is identity politics, has devolved from the speculative philosophy of Hegel uh, throughout uh, the new left Marxism in the 1960s and 70s, ultimately having been absorbed and captured by the neoliberal agenda. Chapter seven, uh, which is entitled The Deep Political Theology of Neoliberalism, provides a tableau of diverse but clearly theological trends in the last 60 years, what I call the imminence movement, from the so-called death of God movement to secular theology to New Age thinking in the 70s and 80s. I probe the ways in which these strands of theological thinking reflect a more general tapestry of popular religiosity that have served to legitimate neoliberal, ne neoliberalism and hold it firmly intact and being cognitively unchallenged. And the last chapter, which I simply call Endings, takes a stab at the urgent, urgent question of what lies beyond the horizons of neoliberalism. A question I've gotten in, cl in classes when I teach about this, and a year ago last spring, I did a very interesting um, seminar with a colleague in communication studies and on neoliberalism. And uh, of course, communication studies has a much larger set of majors than this religious studies, so they, they were the kind of bulk of the class. And the question I kept getting was, so how do we resist neoliberalism? And I said, well, first, the first way you resist neoliberalism is to understand it and to realize how what you consider to be your, your desire to resist neoliberalism is actually a, 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 a form of neoliberal hegemonic thinking. Um, I, I got a question when I gave a, a public lecture at the University of Denver about it two years ago on this, and they said, well, how do we recognize a neoliberal? And I took up my glass and said, 
well, you're looking at him. He said, where? And I said, me. You're looking right at him. I said, as an academic, I am a neoliberal. And this is what I want you to understand. This is in some ways a form of self-critique we're doing. Academics are not used to doing self-critiques. We're used to critiquing everybody else, but not ourselves. Um, and that's what I hope to do. And that's why this book, when anybody reads it, you know, and hopefully they'll understand it, will start to say, well, maybe... I should be looking in the mirror a little bit. Um, so in th finally, uh, um, you know, I, I come back to what Marx and Engels famously wrote in the German Ideology in 1845. The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. The class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production. And so what this book is basically saying, the ruling class of the present era is the so-called knowledge class. Um, what in the first chapter of the book I uh, somewhat provocatively named the Corporate University Financial Information Complex. Uh, it's a class that controls both the means of material production, which is now essentially virtual, in the form of the global symbolic economy of digitized media, computerized investment, and currency transactions, an increasingly credentialed lifelong learning and professional service industry, and a vast intellectual, cognitive, and communicative machinery that rigorously defines and enforces a new global civic moralism of self-criticism and self-deniable, ostensibly aimed at the good of all human time. All the while, this is probably unsettling to hear this, grinding down the dignity and physical livelihoods of workers of all races, cultures, and ethnicities. Um, neoliberalism is not in any way now the old-style capitalism of Marx's day. In fact, the word capitalism is a synonym for neoliberalism may be highly misleading. It is indeed what Marx and Engels call the ruling intellectual force of our contemporary era. So.